People who are interested in the topic of head and neck radiology love to talk about perineural spread. It is easily the most popular topic for educational exhibits at the ASHNR and the ASNR meeting. But what about things that look like perineural spread but aren't? What about the false positives? If you want to be confident about per calling perineural spread, you've got to know what isn't perineural spread as well. I've been preparing this lecture for years, and there are many people who have helped me out with it, including uh, Mohsen Rahman, Kush Daster, Josh Lehman, Jingwen Huang, and Manoj Tanwar. So a shout out to all of them. Let's first talk about the findings of perineural spread so that we know what we're referencing when we talk about the mimics. The, a nerve that is affected by perineural spread is expanded and abnormally enhancing. It enlarges the foramina through which it travels, and it may enlarge the cavernous sinus or Meckel's cave or the pterygopalatine fossa if those areas are involved. Importantly, there is obliteration of fat planes that surround the normal nerve that's really useful to pick up on T1-weighted unenhanced sequences. Denervation atrophy of the downstream muscles that are innervated by the nerve is also a frequent finding. Here's a classic example of perineural spread where we see tumor extending along Vidian's nerve and the greater superficial patrosal nerve uh, all the way back to the seventh cranial nerve from which it arose. Notice that the nerve is expanded and abnormally enhancing classic findings of perineural spread. If you want to make the diagnosis of perineural spread, you've got to understand the underlying anatomy of the nerves. This is a very specific pattern of enhancement running along a very specific anatomic structure. You don't want to mistake this for an artery or vein. This is the expected course of the third cranial nerve. This happens to be lymphoma running on the third cranial nerve. There are some tumors that are particularly prone to perineural spread, such as adenoid cystic carcinoma and lymphoma. Although statistically, squamous cell carcinoma is so much more common, we're going to see it with squamous cell carcinoma, and most other malignancies are at least capable of perineural spread. If you'd like to review this anatomy further, there's a whole other lecture devoted to the anatomy of the cranial nerves in their cisternal segments. Here's another example where knowing the anatomy is critical. This is abnormal enhancement and enlargement of a very specific nerve. This is the auriculotemporal nerve running from the parotid gland behind the mandible to meet up with V3 near the skull base. So you, have, you need to know this anatomy to understand that this is likely to be perineural spread. Another important point to understand is the normal enhancement of the cranial nerves. You need to understand which segments of, for example, the facial nerve will normally enhance so that you can judge areas of abnormal enhancement. There is normal enhancement in the horizontal and labyrinthine segments of the facial nerve, but there is never normal enhancement in the canalicular segment of the facial nerve. So when you see that enhancement right there, you know that the overall enhancement is abnormal. Yes, symmetry is sometimes helpful, but you've got to know which segments normally enhance. Expansion of the foramen through which the nerve travels is a critical finding for perineural spread. For example, here is the foramen rotundum, should be nice and round like that. Instead, the foramen is expanded and in fact eroded around it here as this squamous cell carcinoma extends down along the nerve. So an expanded foramen, a classic finding of perineural spread. If tumor that is spreading along a nerve reaches an area where it can expand, for example, the cavernous sinus or Meckel's cave, it will expand that cavity. For example, here is perineural spread um, along V2, and it's coming into uh, through the cavernous sinus and expanding the cavernous sinus compared to its contralateral side. The same thing happens in Meckel's cave. Obliteration of foraminal fat is a critical finding 
for perineural spread. And the T1 weighted images are really helpful in this circumstance, the T1 weighted images without contrast. So here we see the normal bright fat surrounding the nerve here in the stylomastoid foramen on the normal side. If we go to the abnormal side, that's all grayed out and you can't pick out a nerve surrounded by pristine fat anymore. That's perineural spread, that's tumor filling in the fat of the stylomastoid foramen, another critical finding. Here we see a little further up where the tumor is more evident as it extends along the, uh, the vertical segment of the facial nerve. Nerves that are affected by perineural spread will have denervation atrophy in their downstream muscles because they are injured. So when we see enhancement of a particular group of muscles, like these are the muscles of mastication, right? The masseter muscle, the pterygoid muscle, muscles, and the temporalis muscle. This group of muscles all comes from the same nerve, the third branch of the fifth cranial nerve. And so we know that there's a problem with that nerve that feeds all of these muscles. And in fact, you can see Meckel's cave has been expanded there. Um, so it's not surprising that this is a manifestation of perineural spread. So now that we've talked about the normal findings that we expect to see in perineural spread, what are some of the diseases that can mimic perineural spread? Well, I've laid out some categories here, and we are going to run through each of these categories and give specific examples of mimics in each of these categories. So what normal structures can mimic perineural spread? Mostly we're talking about veins here. Arteries tend to be very predictable. And if you understand the anatomy, you'll know what artery is supposed to be there. Occasionally we'll run into aberrant arteries like hypoglossal or trigeminal aortic arteries, but those tend to be traceable pretty well. So they, they don't tend to be a problem. Veins are not as predictable. And so veins can be asymmetric. They can be an aberrant location and they can be more confusing uh, with regard to perineural spread. Of the veins that's most, that are most confusing, I think the pterygoid venous plexus is number one in the head and neck. The pterygoid venous plexus is a plexus of veins that runs around the medial lateral pterygoid muscles, as the name suggests. It is frequently asymmetric and often engorged in normal individuals. This is a normal pterygoid venous plexus. This is a normal pterygoid venous plexus. But that asymmetry will often catch our eyes and make us think that there must be some pathology to account for all of this extra enhancement. Now, be aware of the pterygoid venous plexus. Look for it on patients that, have, that are normal so that you get a sense of what the range of normal is of this very confusing uh, venous structure. There's a wide range of normal pterygoid venous plexuses, but it's easily mistaken for pathology. There are small veins that accompany every nerve and enhancement along a nerve. When we talk about the normal enhancement of the facial nerve, for example, we're really talking about these vasa nervosa, the, the, the vessels that accompany the uh, nerve. That's really what's enhancing. Perhaps the best example of this are the veins that surround the uh, third branch of the fifth cranial nerve, V3. Now, this sort of melds in with our discussion of the pterygoid venous plexus, and it's really all part of the same veins, but there can be very prominent vascular structures that accompany the fifth cranial nerve, the, the third branch of the fifth cranial nerve. So how can you tell whether you're dealing with true perineural spread or whether you're dealing with just this vasa nervosa? The key is in the nerve itself. If the nerve itself is preserved, and you are seeing enhancement around it, you are probably dealing with normal vasa nervosa. If you see a whiteout where there is abnormal enhancement of the nerve and surrounding structures, then you have to worry about perineural spread.
We talked about normal patterns of facial enhancement. You've got to know what's normal. This enhancement here in the geniculate ganglion on both sides, that's absolutely normal. This enhancement here and here in the vertical segment of the facial nerve, that's normal. So uh, don't be fooled by this normal facial enhancement. A symmetry is helpful, but you should have an understanding of what the range of normal is for the facial nerve and where it's more likely and less likely to be enhancing and where it's not allowed to enhance, right? It's not allowed to enhance um, in, the, uh, in its cisternal segments or in the uh, internal auditory canal. What sort of artifacts might lead us to incorrectly conclude that there's perineural spread? I think the most likely one to be of interest is failure of local failure of fat suppression, where unsuppressed fat might look like enhancement. In theory, chemical shift could be a problem. It might widen the appearance of a nerve that is surrounded by fat, but I'm not sure I've ever seen a great example of that. Field distortions in particular, field distortions at the skull base in 3T scanners um, can, can really cause what looks like abnormal enhancement just from the field distortion. This is why I don't advocate for 3T scanners in evaluation of, skull, of the, skull, the anterior skull base. I think that 1.5 often does a better job just because of these distortions from the skull base. Here's an example of a fat saturation artifact. It looks very focal. If this were abnormal signal all through the entire orbit, you'd probably have an easier time of identifying it as a fat saturation artifact. But when it's more focal and running along a nerve like this, it can be a little bit confusing. What sort of vascular pathology can mimic perineural spread? Well, uh, an aneurysm can, aneurysms, bare aneurysms are usually round, but there are some pulsation artifacts that might be mistaken for perineural spread. Thrombosis can also be confusing if there is enhancement around the periphery. I'll show you an example. Here is a cavernous aneurysm of the internal carotid artery, the cavernous segment of the internal carotid artery. And although all of this is the aneurysm, if you were unwary, you might see just this stripe of white down the center representing a pulsation artifact within this aneurysm and think that that was linear enhancement. It's not its pulsation artifact. Um, uh, and, and all of this, of course, is the aneurysm. When we have a cavernous sinus thrombosis, or in fact thrombosis of any vein, what you often see is a lack of enhancement in the center, but there is still enhancement around the periphery, whether it is the wall of the structure enhancing or whether it is a sub-occlusive thrombus with a small amount of residual flow. Either way, these small areas of linear enhancement at the periphery of the clot can be mistaken for enhancement along a smaller structure, such as a nerve. The cavernous sinus, particularly particularly confusing because there are small nerves running all through here that we are worried about having perineural spread. Benign neoplasms that might mimic perineural spread, schwannomas, when you talk about schwannomas, you talk about neurofibromas, meningiomas might be a little more surprising because we think of those as sessile masses, but I'll show you some examples that are pretty convincing. Again, paragangliomas, you think of sort of as, sort of as spheres. Why would they appear on something when we're talking about linear enhancement? Well, uh, paragangliomas can be very aggressive in their enhancement and can widen foramina uh, and, and therefore uh, mimic perineal spread in that manner. Okay, here's an example of a schwannoma along uh, V3. We, we just talked about how um, you can distinguish the vasa nervosa from perineural spread, but if you can still see that center line of preserved non-enhancing nerve. But if you've got a schwannoma expanding the nerve, then you don't get that sign. Here, it really looks like the entire nerve is involved, because it is, and uh, as well as some surrounding structures. So this looks just like perineural spread, but is in fact a benign neoplasm. Another way that schwannomas can mimic perineural spread is in widening of foramina. Here we see widening of foramen rotundum as a V2 schwannoma goes through. We talked about how this is a classic finding of 
perineural spread, but obviously other diseases can do this as well. We also talked about how perineural spread can expand a space such as the cavernous sinus or Meckel's cave. Well, so can schwannomas. So here is Meckel's cave expanded just like you would expect for perineural spread. And you can see a small amount of tumor heading uh, down, expanding V3 as well. Um, but this expansion of Meckel's cave would be a classic finding of perineural spread, but in this case is attributable to a schwannoma of the fifth cranial nerve. This gets back to the idea that we really need to understand our anatomy. And if you see this linear enhancement along a nerve, um, th this could be perineural spread along a very particular nerve, the only nerve to come from the dorsal surface of the, um, of the, uh, of the midbrain and swing around the front. This is, of course, the fourth cranial nerve, the trochlear nerve. Uh, this is a schwannoma, and maybe it's obvious from the degree of expansion, but you can imagine when it's a little thinner, that it would be harder to distinguish from perineural spread. When we talk about schwannomas expanding the nerves, it's uh, for completeness, I think it's worth talking about neurofibromas. This is a plexiform neurofibroma expanding a, uh, a, a um, the third cranial nerve. I have seen perineural spread do exactly this coming from the lacrimal gland and headed down uh, along the third cranial nerve um, intracranially. So this, this degree of expansion and this pattern of expansion absolutely is can be seen in perineural spread. Now, meningiomas we usually think about as either rounded or sessile masses, but they can travel along uh, a nerve. Uh, meningioma may travel alongside the, uh, the for in this example, V3, but along any of the nerves as they go through the foramina of the skull base. Meningiomas love to travel through foramina if they are in the right location. Now, your clue here is the preservation of V3 as it runs through, and there's just meningioma enhancing on either side of it. The meningioma won't replace the nerve. It will surround the nerve. Uh, but uh, you might even th say that this is a type of perineural spread and that the meningioma is running alongside the nerve. That's not usually what we mean when we use the term perineural spread. Now, in this case, it's pretty obvious this is a meningioma because of the bulky portion of the tumor here in the cavernous sinus. But remember that meningiomas also have dural tails. And if all you're looking at is that linear dural tail running away from the meningioma, that might be confusing for perineural spread particularly worrisome if you have a very aggressive variant of a meningioma, uh, say a HU3 meningioma, that you might expect to have some aggressive features like perineural spread. Um, also, if the meningioma has been resected and all you're left with is the residual dural tail, you can see how that might be confusing. Paragangliomas are confusing because they are aggressive and they can travel along nerves. So here is a, uh, a glomus jugulari tumor, and you can see how aggressively it is eroding through the lateral aspect of the jugular bulb and across the temporal bone out into the uh, out into the parotid gland. You can imagine a tumor in the parotid gland doing exactly the opposite. It's, a, it's coming from down in the parotid and working its way back up along the facial canal uh, instead of this paraganglioma that's growing out of the temporal bone. But a very similar appearance in the pattern of spread. This is the end of part one of Mimics of Perineural Spread.